All right, all right, welcome back. So today we're gonna to be looking at building a simple little markdown blog in Rust. We're gonna be using the Tide Web Framework uh, pull downs to conform to this common mark spec. We'll be using handlebars for templating and the asynchronous standard runtime, as well as Serde and a few other dependencies. Um, so when you're gonna go into building a web application, kind of wanna go at it thinking about its design, its layout, maybe its function and purpose. Try and build in such a way where you can complete something that's minimum viable. Don't worry about uh, like trying to scale to thousands and hundreds of thousands of users. Don't try to go beyond what am I, what's my single purpose for building this and try and iterate on that just for the purpose of learning. And then that way you can kind of actually get something running out the door, right? So if you think about a web framework, uh, what are the sort of minimum viable dependencies for your single purpose application? For this one, you know, all we need is something like a router to route the paths. We need to deal with HTTP types, right? That's going to be a request, a response, status codes, headers, body. We need a, the protocol layer. So if we're dealing with HTTP 1.1, 1.0, do we actually need HTTP 2.0? Do we need that HTTP pipelining? Uh, some of the other features uh, that even coming up with uh, HTTP 3 that recently came out uh, standardized. So just kind of thinking about that, what, what are our protocol layer requirements here? Uh, obviously, maybe we'll need some middleware services, transforms, what kind of things do we want to deal with, like tracing, logs, error handling. Do we actually need authentication for this? You know, if it's just a simple markdown blog, maybe we don't care about authentication because it's just, maybe it'll be a statically sort of generated website. Maybe we don't care about compression. There, some of those little details there that uh, we may want to consider, right? We are going to need an asynchronous runtime for this to run on, right? And we'll be dealing with a little bit with uh, data serialization, like our JSON uh, posts themselves. All right, so if you kind of new cargo uh, init, right? You're going to open it up, cargo init, start adding dependencies. First one here is going to be asynchronous standard. There's a few other runtimes, uh, like Tokyo is a good one that a lot of people use. Uh, small runtime, like small RS. Uh, the problem with kind of some of these other runtimes is the libraries, depending on the library dependency you use, those sort of dictate which runtime you kind of have to use. A lot of them will make them somewhat portable, but it's something you have to consider when doing that. Um, so for an asynchronous runtime like this one, asynchronous standard is a book uh, dedicated to that one. Uh, you've got, with any runtime, you've got some sort of task queue for your futures. Most of them will kind of import from a futures crate that will give you like these async traits for reads, writes, seeks, streaming, buffer readers. Usually all of them will have wrappers around the primitives like your TCP listener, your stream, Unix sockets. Uh, they'll usually use thread pooling for interacting with file system. Uh, usually you'll have things like channel, synchronous, any, any type of uh, network or channel synchronous behavior, those will have async wrappers around them. And all those do is just kind of implement the futures for it. And of course, you also have timeouts, timers, and then the platforms, APIs themselves. Um, so like this is the asynchronous standard packages. You'll see like channels, FS, future, IO. Uh, one thing about I like about asynchronous standard is it actually also imports this uh, small RS uh, minimal runtime and it uses the async IO adapters. And then that's nice, that's nice because you can kind of reuse the standard library uh, and just kind of wrap it in these futures implementations. So I like this because this is this uh, small RS, I used it to kind of learn how to build my own runtime um, and which I have a video on that, on that and we use the polling crate for that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a really good library, easy to kind of navigate the code base and everything. Um, so yeah, kind of implementing that, you got to implement this macro trait for a kind of standard main. Tokyo, it's very similar. You just have Tokyo main. And all that's going to do is kind of expand it out. So here's an example here where we're using the TCP listener on the asynchronous standard crate. And you'll see here, it's just going through a little accept loop, um, writing back to the client. Um, that macro, right, is it, all it's going to do is kind of move that asynchronous function inwards and then call this block on uh, function here, right? So that's pretty common with any asynchronous standard. 
uh, asynchronous runtime. It it's going to spawn some type of task, an asynchronous task, and all that's going to do is kind of return an actual future uh, trait. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about futures and asynchronous runtimes, I have a video dedicated to that. Uh, we kind of go over everything from wakers, the reactor pattern, task queues. Uh, we look at how futures are actually implemented uh, via generators and looking at some of the compile what the compiler is doing for that. So definitely check that out. Uh, so for templating, I'm going to use handlebars for this video. So uh, handlebars.js is pretty commonly used. The Rust uh, um, package for that kind of just wraps it and uses that sort of standard. So it's just going to give us something to evaluate expressions, scaping, caching, um, kind of literal. It's good. So definitely browse handlebars for that, kind of get familiar with the templating syntax. Another one that's used is uh, Terra. So that one's kind of inspired, like it says here, by Django templates. Um, it kind of has that um, brace percentage type syntax, right? And you got these blocks and things like that. Uh, we do need to support markdown, right? So we're going to use the pull down CMark. Uh, this is a what's known as a pull parser implementation. So the code base there is also pretty easy to navigate, um, and it's pretty performant. And it again, it supports the common mark spec. So, um, and you see here the example for that is pretty straightforward. You just kind of like you got your markdown string here, and then uh, create a new parser, pass in some options that maybe aren't part of the common mark spec, like strike throughs, and then output your HTML. Uh, we'll be using Surday, right, to just translate between structs and back into uh, JavaScript, or sorry, into uh, JSON, right? So we're going to be using that so that we can actually put it into our HTML templates. And like I mentioned, we'll be using Tide for our web framework. Also, oh, here's an example. Uh, Tide main, right? So if you look at uh, the complementary blog post for this video, uh, it kind of goes into detail about each of those dependencies and uh, what each line of code here is doing. But we'll kind of go through it line by line here. So uh, first I've got like the Tide um, server itself is being created here. So it's just an app called Tide new. That here is just an implementation of the server that it has in that code base. So you can see here it's using HTTP types, uh, which is a different dependency. I like this HTTP types because it kind of wraps all those uh, common request response uh, as its own type system. And then that's kind of single purpose and uses it uh, that for its own, right? Rather than like you have, then you have another pro layer specifically for the protocol. This just kind of wraps all that. So anyway, you have the server here. It's been created. Uh, the server is pretty basic. It just kind of has a um, thread safe router. Uh, it has some side of state that you can kind of pass around to the request. And it's got this list of middleware uh, that you can use at a uh, before and after for every request and response. Here it's just, uh, you got the path syntax for the dot at, and then you have various ways of manipulating paths and serving up files or using handlers, right? So in this example, it's a serving a directory file at the static path. So here, given a route path, uh, given path relative to the root, you have this uh, routing, uh, what will just map some type of request to an endpoint. So those are the two, those are the constructs. You have the HTTP types for a request, and then you have this trait that's called an endpoint that kind of applies for everything, right? So, um, and each path has kind of segments, and that's kind of how the router is sort of broken up. So you can add wildcards to it. You can add parameters to it. So here you've got files colon user. Uh, static slash star path or just regular star. Uh, here's that implementation for the at, right? So it's just creating a new, uh, it's accessing that router, creating a new route, and now you can work on that particular route itself. So a route just consists of a kind of a mutable borrow to that router, some path, and then each route has uh, its own sort of list of middleware that you can kind of apply to. So each route can have a middleware and then it's endpoint, right? So serving directory, it's you can see here it's calling self.get, which is that uh, get method on there. And then the serving directory is its own 
sort of middleware implementation. Um, there's lots of different methods you can use, right? You've got all, get, head, put, post, delete, options, a number of others are there. They all take an endpoint trait here. So anything that implements endpoint, and they kind of pass it to that method thing. So here's kind of how that's doing, right? Right. So it's just making sure that if it's uh, adding it, adding that um, route to that path or to the router here. So you've got the path, the method, and then it's just kind of wrapping it as a middleware construct. And again, it's using that HTTP types method, right? So everything's kind of going through that HTTP types create. So if you want to implement your own web framework, you kind of use the basics for that. You've got your types, and then you have your protocol layer, uh, some type form of a router, and then a middleware concept. And then obviously some type of templating uh, implementation. All right, so the router is pretty basic. It's just got a hash map of HTTP types method to something called a method router. And that's using this uh, route finder uh, syntax, which is just kind of a B tree map implementation where the route spec is like some type of segments and then the handler is just any type of handler, right? Uh, generically. So that serve directory is an implementation of that endpoint trait. So you hear it's using the async traits uh, macro. I like this because it kind of simplifies the code base rather than trying to implement a whole futures and using generic associated types. Uh, you just can kind of use a syntax. Hopefully, if at some point soon, we'll be able to have async traits natively within Rust. But for now, you kind of have to use that async trait uh, crate as well. So, but here you can see the implementation for an endpoint. You just have that call method, and then it's uh, going through that path and iterating over it, creating, uh, determining where the files are, what files being requested, and then assuming that there is file, it kind of uh, goes through that uh, body from file here, right? To actually grab it, and you, that's an asynchronous task as well. So you get that, it's awaiting that, and then it'll return that response with that body. And again, it's using that HTTP types, like I mentioned. So uh, definitely check that out because uh, it's very helpful to kind of go through what are all the types that I can use, what are all the functions on the requests, the body, all those things, right? Status codes. Again, we're using that again for the assets on the posts and the favicons. Pretty similar. It's just another implementation for the endpoint, right? So here it is, just grabbing that body for that file, assuming it's there, and then returning uh, that status code. So response builder is one of those functions that's on there uh, within the tide. Um, this other thing here is the, uh, it's called a with type of uh, function here. So if we look at that, what that's doing, uh, it's just pushing the middleware function onto the root server, right? So you've got middleware that can be on routes, and then you can have middleware on the uh, root of the server itself. So which will that middleware will be applied to all requests. So here's an example. Here's that trait for that middleware. You see it's an asynchronous trait that has an asynchronous handle, takes a request, and a next uh, function, right? The for that particular trait, there's an implementation. I like this because this trait, this is a trait implementation for any type f, right? Where f happens to be a function that takes a request and a next, right? So this is a nice way to genericize an implementation for any type of function that takes this will have a middleware trait implementation. And so that's all it does is it just, you can take, you can pass a closure as soon as you declare a closure that takes a request and a next, and you kind of use that dot with syntax, or the um, then you'll have a you, it'll have this associated handle function, right? And that's just calling it right with that request and the next. You can see here in the log middleware implementation within Tide, it's doing that here, where assuming that you've got a middleware implementation for the log middleware, right? It's just calling self dot log. And then it uses this uh, dot run. So that's on this next uh, struct here. So it'll run the rest of the request of the middleware, 
first, and then it'll wait that and print OK. That's only if it's already been run. Otherwise, here it'll uh, log out the request, and then it'll call run the rest of the little middleware, and then it'll log out the response. So here's the after syntax, because you can see here we're trying to use app.with after, and we're passing in something called an error handler. So errors is our own implementation, but we want this to run after everything, all the middlewares are run. So in this case, we're calling next.run, passing in the request. And then as soon as that returns, we get a response. And then we expect that, okay, well, now we want to handle that response. Maybe there's an error. Maybe there's no errors. Maybe we've got a status code that we care about. So that's after middleware. The before middleware would be as you would expect. It runs the function first with that request, and then it'll run the rest of the middleware. And then as you would expect with that next implementation, all it takes is a endpoint, right? And the next uh, list of next middleware. And all it's doing is kind of iterating over that. So assuming you've got a next middleware at all, it'll you know update that next middleware, call it call its associated handle function, and then go ahead and uh, call that endpoint at the end. As we were mentioning before, that trait for endpoint it's going to have this async call function on there for that trait. And this is an exa another example of how we how it's genericized across anything that is a function that takes a request. So typically you're not nobody's implementing an endpoint uh, trait. Usually you just pass a function, uh, which is what we're doing with that error handler. But this is a nice way to kind of like another way to show how we can generically implement uh, for any type f uh, on a trait. In this case, it's just a function that takes a request and it returns a future, right? And there's the output and it has a send and static, which means, right, we want it to be safely to be able to share and send across um, uh, threads, right? So, and then the result it has to be into response. So anything that can be turned into this response type. So our error handler, right, like we mentioned, it's going to take a response type and it's going to return a tied result with that response. So we're going to downcast it from an async standard IO error if there is an error on that response. And if it happens to be not found, then we're going to go ahead and set that status code to not found. Here, we're taking the fact that if there's any status where it's not success, meaning it's any non-200 uh, result status, we're going to use this thing that I implemented here called a registry, and I'll get that in a second, where we're going to render out the status and the status code and the status text, right? So here it's, I'm importing here on registry, right? So uh, registry, the first thing I've done here is I've created a thread local. This is just kind of a way to uh, have a thread local storage. It's just so that I've got a static uh, de declaration here of state. And then I want to be able to access that later on safely within a thread. So it's just a okay, way to kind of like instantiate uh, kind of thread local variables here. So and here's that implementation where I'm grabbing the handlebars here. So I'm using the handlebars handlebars to create a registry. These are the things that I want to be able to register the actual templates themselves and then render content to them. Anything that will provide JSON serializable data, that's how you kind of render it here. So you can see that T1 data. I like handlebars because it's kind of pretty easy to navigate and it's uh, pretty standard. Uh, I've used it quite a bit in JavaScript as well. So uh, the registry for that's pretty basic, right? You just call that register temple template file give it a name and a path. So I'm saying, okay, I'm going to have this file that I'm calling post.html and the actual template is in this client dist post.html. And you can see here, it's, again, it's pretty simple. It's just have a file source and then make sure to load it into the template sources. Uh, I'm also creating these helper functions for rendering. 
So I just want to make sure that I create a simple response type that has a 200 status code. And then I want to call this render body. I've also made use of this tracing macro here. Um, I won't get into that in too detail right now, but um, there's these other little crates that you can use to kind of add tracing uh, or logging abilities to your web application. Um, I might make a separate video dedicated just to tracing and logging because it's a little bit more in depth, um, but it's a nice handy way to, to add some features to your uh, um, web application here. Also go render body, right? So I'm just making sure anything that's serializable, uh, given a response, right? I'm just gonna go ahead and call that render function and then setting the body and the mime type. Uh, whenever you call this thread local, if I had it here, that thread local here, it needs to use this with syntax. Uh, there's another library that I've used called scope TLS, which will let you do thread, um, I think it's scoped thread local, that's what it is. And it's kind of a different way to do it so that you can assign the variable in line. And then it's, uh, as long as it's been assigned, you can use it that way. Anyway, so you gotta use this dot with syntax for that. And now you have the current uh, current value here. Now we can call that render body. So this is nice because I don't have to have necessarily access to it here in the function. I can just kind of grab it from within the thread. And here again, I'm passing that status in the canonical reason. And that's just using that JSON uh, JSON macro, right, from Sardai JSON. And so did JSON will let you do lots of different things, right? You can parse from string here into back into a struct here. So that'll take something like this and turn it into that. But of course, and right now I'm just saying I want to convert all of this back into a actual Sardai JSON value. And then there's a dot two string on it. All right, so now we got to create some routes. So routes configure is what I've got so far. And here I'm just having a simple little configure function. It's going to use this dot at syntax like we mentioned before. Got a year, month, day, ID parameters. And I'm using that get uh, method on that endpoint, right? So it's passing that endpoint, which is the implementation. Happens to be this get post function, async function. Just like serve dir, serve file, right? There's also nest, uh, and that's kind of nice because you can do this path here where it's like at hello, and then you call us nest, and then now you can create a whole subset of examples. So here it's like, oh, well, at nest, the root at that is going to include um, this other function, right? So you can kind of combine these. So if I want to do, you know, something like, dot at admin, I'm going to pass in maybe this middleware that has authentication. And within that, it's, I'm going to nest these other paths like manage posts, manage settings, things like that. All right, so for our get post here, just make sure to create a URL path for it, given the parameters. So you got this rec.param on there, and that'll give you the parameter by name. Just opening up that file, and again, that's using that um, asynchronous standard fs file and the read extensions. So we get those nice dot awaits for those files. As soon as I got the markdown file here, I'm going to use pull down cmark to actually parse it. So I had that example at the beginning here where I went ahead and converted it, gave it some options, parsed it, and got some HTML. And then finally, we use that registry again to go ahead and render out that output. Although this would actually be post.html, not index. All right, last thing we got to do is actually call listen. Uh, this listen function doesn't have to be a string. That There's a lot of different uh, things you can do. It's anything that implements this to listener trait. So a couple things. One is string or a string in a U16 or even just a asynchronous standard net TCP listener or a 
TCP listener. So if you browse the Tide source code, it's actually pretty uh, easy to navigate and understand. It's a good learning exercise. Hey, anyway, once once you got a listener, you've got this uh, implementation for it, uh, listener state for that type, and it has this async bind here as the first thing it's doing, and then it also has the accept, right? So the accept state. Let me see here where that first. Yeah, so that first function here, that listen that we're calling, it's calling listen dot bind, and it's waiting on that, and then as soon as it grabs the proper info. It'll call that accept dot await. So again, the implementation for that will have, is something that's going to be this here. As soon as we got some addresses, connection string TLS, then we got the accept here. So here you can see it's converting an incoming stream, and then it's just dot next in await all that. So as soon as every time we get an accept, we're going to do dot await on that, and that's going to use that underlying polling events reactor uh, within that runtime. So it's awaiting some type of event to happen. And then as soon as we got our stream, we're going to go ahead and handle that TCP. And that's going to spawn a new task on the runtime here. So we have an asynchronous task. And that's just going to use this async h1, um, which I like because H it's just, again, it's a separate single purpose crate. Its whole job is to actually just give you a HTTP parser, and then uh, it implements that as an encoder or decoder. So you can see here the um, accept right function here, accept one, and then the actual decode of the HTTP request. Uh, there's other libraries. Uh, Hyper is a pretty popular one. Um, I found that the Hyper had too many dependencies uh, that I didn't really care for, like tower services and some of those things that I didn't quite need. Um, I liked async what h1 and some of the more minim minimalistic uh, async type traits. Um, as I think, I think as we see more async traits within Rust, uh, once that what like it lands support in the runtime uh, within uh, Rust itself, then I think we're going to see more minimalistic libraries that look a little bit cleaner and easier to kind of work with. At least for me, I think I think it was the code base for this uh, is fairly straightforward to kind of understand. Um, I don't know, it's just like as a protocol layer, it, to me, it, as a mental model, it made more sense. And then finally, right, we've got our app here, we're calling respond, uh, passing in that request. So here's in that tide. Uh, this is in the server. Right, so we're given a request. We're gonna create our root for the router state. Use that router.route, so we got an actual endpoint in our parameters. And then we're gonna wrap that in a next, and then call next.run, and then get our response. All right, so now that we have that, let's go ahead and um, for now, I'm using Tailwind, Parcel, Highlight.js. Uh, again, this is on the blog post related to this. So you can check that out. Uh, just make sure you add these dependencies here and then call npm install. And that'll give you your um, client code, right? And then again, you can kind of copy this from the blog post. Uh, but this is just some HTML that has the content. So here's the uh, associated handlebars content that we passed in earlier. And this is the style associated with that uh, for Tailwind and the Tailwind configuration, as well as the post CSS configuration. Once you run this, right, you should get something similar to this. Um, first have to build that with parcel, which will give you your output. Uh, for this actually should be index CSS and in post HTML. And then once you can run that, you can run that in cargo and you should get a blog, right? So, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Let me show you the, uh, code base a little bit similar to that. So let's see here. And this is actually related to my personal blog. Um, I also have this Docker file that I used to deploy. Um, so that's kind of nice. And then the associated spec file for that. 
Um, you can see here I've got my posts and my assets for that. So that's all in that content directory. Client, again, that's going to be similar. You've got that post. I'm just passing in a few things like our title, um, a couple other things like our content. I'm kind of having these other features for hiding. Uh, one thing I probably didn't show in this is actually the way I'm doing the posts is a little bit different. Um, so if we look at our routes here, uh, matching, I still have that get post. I've got a few other routes that I'm using, uh, but for get post, let's see if we can find it here, get post. I'm calling this render markdown. I'm also instrumenting it with tracing. And then that render markdown is creating a post here. And then I'm using this function that I made. So it just takes some of that code we did for opening up that file and converting it. But I'm also parsing the contents of that uh, post to see if we can find some, just some uh, pre kind of like headers here. So if we see here, like, let's see if we can find one. So at the top here, I've just got a couple little, just little uh, properties of that markdown file. And I'm using that here when I'm parsing it out uh, line by line until I get to it, right? Yeah, so then once you get that content uh, there, then again, I, just, I should still use that render function. Uh, that's the same. Our main function is a little bit different. All I did was I added uh, tracing to that, which we'll get into another video. I added that tracing middleware. Uh, I still have the error handler and all that stuff. So, and I also use these option from the environment variables. Uh, our registry is pretty much the same. Uh, error handler is the same. Routes. That's pretty much it. Uh, if you like this video, give it a like. Uh, please subscribe if you haven't already subscribed. And yeah, definitely look out for the next one. Thanks again.